Hello and welcome back. The Blues are 4-0. Today, I'm giving myself a challenge. The challenge is talking about the game without mentioning the umpires challenge. It wouldn't be a Carlton game without drama. Yes, I know the non-touched call was blatantly wrong, but in my view, both teams weren't trying to win this game, it felt. When the opportunities came round, both teams basically said, nah, let's do ourselves a major disservice here. Today, we're looking at some of these opportunities and some things that stood out to me in the last quarter of the match, which I felt had a significant bearing on the result of the game. If you do go on to enjoy this one, make sure to drop a like and subscribe if you are new, so you're notified of when I do analysis, which will be next week. And there's also an option to become a channel member if you would like. Enjoy. So this play early in the last is one of these very examples of a Fremantle opportunity gone begging. Newman comes over towards Young, and Carroll is on Young's left side as well. In a bid to favour the left foot without swinging it out of bounds, he props up and swivels to angle a kick towards the Toyota logo. Now, this isn't just a great kick for the fact that it opens up the entire ground, but it is also incredibly deceptive for that fact. You see, naturally, it would be favourable to go further across, which Fremantle did well on this day, or kick right down the middle to centre half forward. Now, notice that Carlton's players have moved in correlation with such a move, but Andy Brayshaw noticing that movement fills the void that Carlton have just left on the side that the ball just came from. And so that's where the ball heads. Even though the play slowed up because O'Meara had to wait for that Brayshaw run to present an option, it means a forward 50 kick is accessible, and it's a perfect kick to Jai miss leading up. Newman running backwards doesn't stand a chance to reach where a miss meets it. And the reason the mark is so easy to collect, aside from the kick being perfect, is because a miss split himself from his direct matchup by using another contest with Wietering involved as a shield. Tabiner applies a bit of a roadblock and McGovern never is able to close the gap. So great opportunity presented. However, a good kicker from set shots does not convert. So what could have been essentially a three goal buffer for Frio to start the last was in fact not. This here is a huge contest won by the Blues off the back of a Frio clearance. And this is why Carlton remained in the game despite getting smoked in clearance. Their backline remaining sturdy. It's as simple as that. That little Wietering knock-on goes to Williams and the only reason I can see this not being holding the ball is because the fend-off was successful and Williams just drops it himself. You can see the line of blues unattended, which means you can use those to chain up a play into the forward 50. But Frio were on crack for Smothers in this game. Pretty sure they had 10 in the first half alone. Usually though, those defensive plays are rewarded with territory, but that's why Saad's smother is so important. Immediately, you've snatched that advantage away, and that yet again reflects Frio's inability to convert. Not with regards to the scoreboard, but by their around the ground advantages as well. Important block by Williams, so the window of daylight is afforded to handball it to Carroll, and then an inadvertent block by Hewitt on Sarong, so Carroll can kick it inside 50. One of those kicks where it's so bad it's good. Ryan and Draper are way off it. Cripps is holding Young off the ball. And with the ball dropping here, Brandon Walker behind Owies, all Owies needs to do is simply shelter the drop zone and fall into the path of the ball, which he does so well that it forces Walker to infringe, even though Owies took the mark anyway. And what wasn't converted on one end by the Dockers was by the Blues. This would have hurt Frio straight off the back of that always goal. The tap by De Koning is superb to Cripps, who sidesteps well to evade the tackle. Young was Hewitt's man, and Brayshaw is the last line in this stoppage. Jackson also is sucked in. Brayshaw has committed to stopping the forward hand pass, whilst Hewitt and De Koning have sensed the outnumber at the front of the stoppage. Brayshaw has no impact, De Koning does the right thing in hand passing to Hewitt, but he's not even looking. He feels rushed when he definitely had a bit of time to swivel and handball just as quickly. A good handball nails on a forward 50 entry, potentially allowing the smaller players to spread to the flanks, and Charlie or Harry can sprint right down the middle to receive a lace out pass. But with the lack of precision in the handball, We'll never know what could have happened. A missed opportunity for the Blues to add some scoreboard damage. Then we'll see it again from a Blues standpoint. 
Charlie Kerno's on the complete other side of the ground. Harry Mackay here. Harry sticks out an arm. Pierce falls to the floor. And obviously that is the importance of Harry shining right there. Being able to be that clearing kick out of the back 50. Harry was definitely aiming over the top. But always is perfectly placed for a kick that falls short. As he turns around to meet it in front of H. Chera's just come off the bench. We can get a deeper entry because that short pass is on. You'll notice that Fogarty has two vital moments of impact here. The initial rove to stop Frio from, you know, getting that handball out and starting up a chain the other way. Then when the ball is knocked away in the tackle, he toe pokes it ever so subtly to Carlton's advantage. For where the congestion is in the forward pocket, Carlton's handball game using the man at the back of the contest is so damaging. They draw the man, find the extra, retreat only marginally in terms of territory, but to the benefit of space centrally. But why Harry Mackay snaps this around the corner confuses me given he's on his dominant kicking side and then Akers, even with O'Meara closing, surely could just straighten up either to drop punt it or even just dribble it through. The semi-final last year would indicate a bit of experience with that. Then the Dockers take the mantle of blowing opportunities. Akers played on, and whilst the Docker had overcommitted, it was the wrong decision for Akers to do this. He's opted to kick on his opposite foot to reach Charlie or Cottrell, but if that doesn't pan out, he's got nothing on longer with Ryan planted behind the ball and always not available for a handball receive. And so when it's turned over because of the miscue, Chera has been absolutely burnt by Nat Fife, and so Adam Saad leaves his man. But then the other issue is Jordan Clark is killing Matt Owies off the break, so Saad's impact is easily broken, and then McGovern leaves his man, which may have been the most crucial of peel-offs. But at the very start of the play before the turnover, Newman was on Tabiner. Newman's rolled up, meaning Tabiner is in acres of space. So it was either Tabiner wide open, put the kick in front, or with McGovern running straight at you, send it left. There is so much space to put it into. But instead, Clark goes right over the top of McGovern, which means he's got to add a bit more air to it, and that's where the shocking kick arises. Though they luck out with a ricochet, but yet again on the right side to kick a drop punt and the option to straighten up, but the pressure got to Brayshaw, and he's just rushed things with another miscued snap. This goal would have been massive for Frio at the time. This basically sums up the contest for me. The kick doesn't get to the 50, handball is contested, the receiver of the handball is getting attention, and then you can just see Docker's numbers collapse. It's crazy on multiple occasions as well. That makes this clearing kick so important for the numbers the Blues have and the space that's afforded. This tackle here by Cripps is so important and the first of many big moments by our captain in the final 10 to 15 minutes of the match. Instead of tackles that just result in continual ball ups, we get the ball in a good position to hit the hot spot, something that wasn't easy to achieve in this game. Matt Kennedy's goal is a vital one, though let's make a note of this. One-on-ones basically everywhere except on the defensive side of the stoppage for both teams. Sets the trend for the late game. Beating your assignment would leverage your team's chances of winning. Kemp's tackle is huge in this contest. Starting corridor side works wonders for him. Not only does it restrict Banfield's movement, but Frio don't have the numbers to support him. Banfield's angled towards the line and being brought down in that direction means he doesn't have a chance of reaching a docker with the handball. And that spurs on the break with the superb kick to Charlie. And then we've talked in the past about Charlie's field kicking on the break. This is a little bit different. This didn't allow much leeway for error, but my God, it is a cracking kick that drops perfectly for Kennedy. So much so, the Draper shits himself and holds the jumper free kick and the Blues are in front. The Amiss shot earlier in the quarter with the change of direction allowing that shot on goal. You'll see it again here with the ball movement. Sarong's kick goes inward. All the Blues have their eyes on a kick going around here, but not here. And that is where Jackson sends it. And whilst the kick doesn't directly result in a mark, it does allow a kick to the top of the square. I don't know what Orazio is doing so deep in the back line, but you can just see the lack of defensive IQ. Sharp is boundary side, so all Orazio needs to do 
is hold ground. But unbelievably, he puts an arm in front of Sharp and then just alienates him as he tries to hold position on the goal line. De Koning doesn't get in front of the ball, Banfield runs at it and gets both hands behind the ball straight to Sharp and the finish is superb. Dockers back in front. So after Brody Kemp gets pinged for holding the ball, the Dockers are in front by nine points with under five minutes to play. And then walk in the umpires. Nope. In comes Josh Tracy. This guy was a bit of a double agent to close the game out because this pickup here was absolutely amazing off of Fremantle clearance. And then He's absolutely darting to the outer side wing to get Fremantle possession further upfield. But it's like he exerted all his energy running because he wasn't strong in the marking contest. He just lost the footy with both hands to it because he got bumped by a bloke 13 centimeters shorter. And so instead of a mark and a kick to Fremantle's forward pocket inside the final four minutes, up two goals, Carlton are back up their end with a shot at goal of their own. Now, in comes Patrick Cripps. Zach Williams in traffic was equally exceptional, but really, if you're Freo, you cannot have Cripps this close to the contest this late in the game when you have a slight cushion. Young should be right on him in the case of the ball bobbling out in an attempt to keep the ball enclosed. Credit to Cripps, man, because as Hutto said, All over him now. Cripps, if anyone could, it was Cripps. Look, the Blues had no business getting a forward 50 entry given the situation, but Frio have just got to know better. That should have simply never resulted in the concession of a goal. And so whilst Frio's dominance in clearances was large, that one clearance right there makes you disregard stats completely for what this one clearance resulted in. That ends up in a crazy grab to Charlie. The team is now down too. And then in come the umpires again. No wait, it's double agent Josh Tracy again. When we talk about big time players rocking up in big time moments, there's a reason that phrase is overused. It's because it's true. Big time players mark this ball, then you have the rest who shit themselves when the pressure arises. It's the second time it's happened, and given now it's the final two minutes and the lead's even more marginal, it's a shocker of an error. Now, before the controversy of the Cottrell shot at goal, we have a bit of foreshadowing. This is where Cottrell is, and to counter the Blues numbers trying to keep it inside the forward 50, you've got Dockers players trying to keep that ball out of goal. Banfield is directly behind the stoppage, and then you've got Tracy as the loose in the goal square, but no one is filling this gap here. The ball drops here, and with Cottrell in front, it's similar to how Owe's got his chance. Aish is here tracking this blue on the paint, leaving this little bit of space. Hewitt is on the right side to get a kickoff on his right side, should the ruck work send it there as he holds off Rachel. A stoppage later, it's slightly adjusted in terms of where players are, but Hewitt has that space on his right side to kick it into that space we mentioned. And you'll see Sarong actually move to Hewitt's left, playing into this outcome panning out. What happens? The tap to Hewitt, and even though Cottrell is reached off a kick that was touched, really there should have been someone identifying that space in multiple areas and filling it so you don't even give the umpire an opportunity to call a mark. I think it's poetic, this final sequence here, watching Patrick Cripps even with the game beyond doubt and knowing what he's contributed in the late game. Cripps affects the handball by Jackson to Brayshaw, then prevents the clear possession for Clark. And then right at the end of the sequence, Cripps cancels out a clean possession for Brayshaw. Excellent work rate for this stage of the game by the captain leading from the front. So look, when I assess this last quarter, I see opportunities for both teams. I see clear blunders by both teams. And look, call bad umpiring all you want, but Fremantle man, a few lapses and a lack of composure here and there earlier in the last. Time to run down the clock at stages later on in the game. Look, they had their chance and they fumbled it whilst Carlton simply punished them for it. What do you think? Was it the umpires? Or is that excuse a cover up for Freo simply having themselves to blame? Let's hear your thoughts in the comments. I hope you enjoyed. We'll be back next week for another Carlton analysis. But until then, stay safe. Have a good one. Chat to you soon. Bye for now.